let us pray. Our everlasting Father, we come to you this morning with joy and gladness in our hearts. We acknowledge that you are the only awesome and mighty God. You show yourself strong to those whose hearts are faithful to you. And therefore this morning, we want to thank you and bless you. We pray, Heavenly Father, that even as they travel back to their homes and their countries, you will cover them with the same Shekinah glory that you covered them as they came here. We thank you that you will bless them abundantly. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you very much. A, a quick uh, a welcome to you by the chair of the organizing committee, Dr. Professor Lynette Gohole. I want to say welcome and thank you very much for honoring our invitation, uh, submitting abstracts, and coming to present and share. Let me take the opportunity to invite the uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor in charge of uh, academic and student affairs, Professor Ruth Otunga, to give her remarks. Glad this morning that uh, we are here uh, to interact in this um, uh, conference, the International Interdisciplinary Conference number 6, 2019. We are happy as a university to host uh, this international conference. I would like to recognize Sister Felicia, who really is like the brainchild of these uh, conferences. Thank you very much, uh, Sister. I would like to welcome our Vice Chancellor. I will start also by welcoming each one of you. This, this conference is um, an interdisciplinary conference of a consortium of universities. That's Mount Kenya University, Chambogo University, the university from Nigeria, Chukwe Emeneka, until feel free. This is an academic discourse. You can discuss, and then we feel we come up with a way forward where we can also present to the stakeholders, to the ministry, saying that this is what the sixth international interdisciplinary conference held at this university resolved to do. Professor Bitang Ndemo is a professor of entrepreneurship at the University of Nairobi's Business School. Dr. Kipkurui Langat, who is the Director General and CEO of Technical and Vocational Education and Training Authority, TVETA. Next, we have Dr. Lea Mumbwa Munyao. Dr. Mumbwa is an educationist who possesses experience in education, management, and leadership with a good interface drawn from public and private sector. Professor Miriam Kinyua, she's a full professor in the Department of Biotechnology, University of Eldred, where she's teaching and carrying out research. Our theme, of course, is towards achievement of sustainable development goals, SDGs, opportunities, and challenges. Uh, Dr. Munyao, who will speak on leadership. Professor Kinyua, who will talk about food security. Dr. Langat will speak about TVET in general, as well as education and training. Professor Bitange Demo will speak to us about technology, how it, it will interface with all these areas in order to assure the, the, the achievement of sustainable development goals. The definition of food security by FAO is that situation that exists when people secure access to sufficient amounts of safe and nutritious food for normal growth and development and an active and healthy life. In that definition, you didn't hear about production. Food production is part of contributing to food security. Sub-Saharan Africa is the poorest region in the world. When you are poor, you will not be able to access food, live alone grow food, because production and access requires facilitation. If we uh, challenge ourselves and be able to produce technology 
that is going to feed, to answer, to respond to the needs of our farmers, our consumers, and by the way, even the policy makers, then we will be contributing to achieving of sustainable development goals because our agriculturists will lead in food production. Our um, engineers will lead in food processing. Our agribusiness and business uh, students and lecturers will lead in being able to advise us where is this food needed? What kind of processing do we need? By the way, in the definition of, of uh, food security, it should also be acceptable food. We have economic blocks that we have formed uh, that we can be able to make use of to be good neighbors and be able to provide for each other. When someone knows that you do not have food, they know you're desperate. We must be able to influence policy makers. Then we must be able to come up with workable, thought through situations. And you remember I've put the word thought through. You must think through up to the end. Lastly, we must have the courage and the strength to face the challenge. Asante sana. How do we rethink the education and training uh, to address this SDG within the specific time frame that has been given? We should be concerned for sustainable human and social development in the sense that what we invest in that must be sustainable and it must be, uh, we must be able to demonstrate the return of investment in that. Recognizing the diversity of uh, realities, live realities, while reaffirming what we call the universal ethical values. And the fundamental purpose of education uh, in this regard is to ensure or uh, to enhance, sustain the dignity and capacity of human person in relation to the nature. And I think that is the aspect of where sustainability. Sometimes we have thought so much about uh, economic and technological development at the expense of nature. And in this case, we must carry both with the ethical consideration and conscience that we are supposed to um, take care of the nature. When we talk of the food, 17 goals of uh, SDG, I think the very right one that is directly touching on us is goal number four which to ensure inclusive and equitable and quality education and training, both for primary or basic uh, and higher education. And within the basic, of course, we are looking at quality, primary and secondary education for all. Also the issues of early childhood that fit into the primary. And for uh, higher education, we are looking at the equal access to TVET and higher education, and specifically focusing on relevant skills for work, gender equity for all and access, and also looking at the issues of youth and adult literacy so that it informs the access of information. We are also looking at the global citizenship uh, education for sustainability, and this is going to promote mobility of um, either uh, workforce or um, the services that we require. We are looking at the safe and inclusive learning environment to ensure that this is achieved. We have the issues of scholarship for higher education. Call number four is looking at the teacher training and the working conditions for the teachers to ensure that they are able to transfer the knowledge that they have. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here this morning, and uh, I just thought that it's important we reflect on the role of leadership because SDGs being 
universal transformative goals that are set to stimulate action on various aspects of human life and the continent, the question I was wondering, what is going to stimulate this action towards getting, attaining these sustainable development goals? And to me, it is all about leadership. Everything begins and ends with leadership. But before I share my reflection, I also thought of about the context in which those people in leadership are going to implement these SDGs. We are talking about an environment where there's a lot of environmental degradation, extreme violence, political instability, unemployment. So the people in leadership working in such an environment, what then is it that they're supposed to do? And to some extent, what kind of leadership is going to be necessary to drive this agenda. From where I'm seated, I'm looking at institutions led by people who possess value innovative leadership, which is lead leadership that goes beyond setting plans. It's a leadership whereby leaders must accept that they can do more with less. Ethical leadership is what is going to drive these goals to fruition, whereby people in leadership Will, be, will feel that they owe the society a lot. When you are a leader and you are guided by this ethical leadership, you will worry more about the community. Why do you exist to provide leadership? You will be honest with the resources that have been given, allocated to you. To what extent are people at institutional level, both national and county, taking advantage of their competitiveness? creating blocks which can produce results. For example, this uh, conference is an, is an example of a collaborative leadership. Leadership that is going to be driven by setting priorities, setting strategic direction, which is going to drive what is important. And therefore, from where we sit, it is very, very important that people in leadership are held more accountable People in leadership should be able to raise questions. To what extent are leaders aware of the realities ahead of them to protect local consumptions? Leaders who are able to tap both the human and natural resources that they have. To what extent are the political leadership in many African countries steered those natural resources towards economic growth? So we are looking for leadership that is accountable, leadership that is not self-centered, leadership that is uh, ready for consequence management, and leadership that looks at growing the institutions and leaving the world for a better tomorrow. I would just like to tell you that at the commission, how are we looked at the role of SRC from the, the perspective of the, the, the development goals? We are looking forward to reinforcing special skills and especially in the area of health. Another thing is when we try to control the payments, we want to make the cost of labor cheap in this country. And therefore, when we push wages in the public sector, it also has a direct impact on the private sector. We are also looking at leadership that can influence policy implementation. You all know that policy implementation at times takes a, a, a political a atmosphere Sometimes policies are implemented depending on the preference of the government of the day. But again, as leaders and as scholars, we should not tire of pushing on what is right. Poor leadership is going to lead this state, the, the SDGs to be just statements of intent. Thank you. What we refer to as the first industrial revolution, uh, we saw the changes in terms of improving productivity. And early in the 1900s, we also saw another revolution came when they started mass production in order to lower the cost, improve productivity. From mid 1950s, we saw intensive search for ways of improving productivity. And in the 90s, we began to see the results using ICTs to create greater productivity. 
And they started looking at how can we further improve productivity. And that's how the fourth industrial revolution was born, which we are in at the moment. Now, what would change from the third to the fourth industrial revolution? You are going to see major changes with respect to the technologies that would drive the fourth industrial revolution. One of the technology is big data, big data analytics. Then the second is blockchain. Big data leads to what we call artificial intelligence. Then you have internet of things. We have 3D printing. We have, we have so many, up to 10 technologies that will drive the fourth industrial revolution. But let me explain the first three or four so that you understand what is happening. We are having, having a problem in Africa because of our randomness. We don't have multinational restaurants like Burger King because we are not able to standardize production. For you to scale, you must standardize, yeah? Ugali is softer from Nairobi. It hardens the more west you go, <laughs> yeah? By the time it's at Bungoma, it's a weapon. <laughs> it's so hard, it's so hard. So some companies uh, like Amazon wants to provide food to everybody in the world the way they want it, yeah? How they want it, when they want it, um, and at what price that you want it. That's why these companies, we call them platform economies, they are going all over the world studying our behavior. Today, a lot of financiers are not giving you loan, asking you for collateral. They are giving you loan based on your behavior. If you want money today, a few seconds from now, from Fulisa, from Tala, from Branch, you would get it and they don't know you, but they predict how you would behave to <laughs> give you the money. <laughs> that is from big data, big data analytics. 21st century, we can't ask Professor here, Kenya, what should I do to harvest the most from this piece of land? You know, that's how it's supposed to be. That's the role of academia, so that you've seen now the seed everybody is queuing to buy it because they know that productivity has gone up. They know they would attain what they were looking for because of data, like the Israeli universities. One university, Technion, in a year, they make $4 billion from commercialization of research, $4 billion, that's one. They can earn the salary they want yeah. As we have refused to come together like this and say, tell government we thank you, we should not be paid by you from next year. Actually, we'll make it. But I will be the first one to come to University of Eldoret and say 1,500 acres, boom, we'll make five, six, seven billions and we donate a little bit to some students who can't pay their fees. When we talk about Artificial intelligence, we are not talking about general intelligence. We're talking artificial. This is areas where we forget, you know, and it has helped us because this morning I woke up at three to be the, at the airport at five. I put my mobile, that's artificial intelligence. My mind could not remember to wake up <laughs> at that time. <laughs> That is artificial intelligence. Then the second, he talked about 5G. 5G is the speed at which you would be accessing content yeah, from online. Now we need even faster because even our teaching is going to be online such that if I a student was sick, they can actually download or can stream directly on their bed in hospital and they are able to see internet of things. Um, 
is it's actually going to help us more than the scary thing you said that you have reached is going to tell you this, uh, but also security, you know, that someone comes to open here, I could actually tell him, my friend, what are you doing there? There is so much that we are going to see from the fourth industrial revolution. Um, lastly, on, um, on, on the technology side, what it helps us also is prototyping. It's, it, the time has been cut drastically that you can prototype and begin to produce much faster than we have done before. So these are technologies that would help us. Actually, SDGs copied from our Vision 2030. When, the vi when SDGs were being created, every country gave what they thought. You know, if you look at the Vision 2030, it's actually you have in SDGs. So I leave here as for questions. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Much. We have heard from um, the training uh, component, and I wonder with all that is happening in technology, do we still need to go to school all these years that we do? We are now in the fourth industrial revolution. Maybe our educational system should also change to reflect that. And he did address that a bit, the fact that we can now access education. What do you have to do about sustaining that original taste that we are losing out as far as the GMOs are concerned? It isn't genetic modification to blame because Genetic modification is a tool. It is in the product. So it just depends on how we use the tools. Um, I teach um, biotechnology as well as classical plant breeding. But each one of them will lead to the loss of the original uh, quality whether we apply GMO, I mean uh, genetic modification, or we apply classical plant breeding. As researchers, we do not uh, put into consideration what uh, the people who we are developing for require. We just do it just because it is scientific and it will earn us um, a report that we are going to write that we've achieved and that's it. My name is Donald, Professor Donald Otieno uh, from University of Eldoret. Now, up to now, I think there's still this perception that uh, a degree qualification is uh, better than a technical one. And so what uh, measures uh, is your authority taking to, to change this uh, perception? Thank you. Thank you very much. Prof, for that question, I, I think um, partly the problem that we have about perception of TVET is historical in the sense that um, for a very long time we had looked at it as um, an alternative path for those who are not able to make in the mainstream uh, education system. So what we've done first through provision of uh, both the policy and legal framework is to make sure that we reevaluate the aim and the objective of technical education. And as I said earlier on, to provide the critical mass of that uh, human resource that we require. And uh, how do we make it critical? The first important thing is of the quality and relevance. At every other time, that education must be of quality and relevance to address a specific need. And we have done this through, first of all, provision of um, infrastructure. It's now possible to access technical education uh, everywhere in this country. The other thing is to relook at the curriculum to be able also to address the needs uh, of the consumers. And as Prof. said, and, uh, uh, Professor Bitanga mentioned the use of the technology in delivery and to improve on the issues of um, making it more current is the, 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 the change in the mindset of the people to accept 
what this is going to address. And therefore, you do the curriculum right from uh, getting the needs of the consumers, if it is the industry, if they are farmers, what is it that they require and how do we have the skills to address that? Thank you. Thank I want just to make a very uh, important observation. All your presentations actually end up to quality of education that we have been offering in this continent since the European colonizers left. The leadership we are complaining about is a reflection of what type of education we have given to our leaders. Kenya and the other collaborating uh, colleagues of ours here go back and look at the quality of the teachers they have. I think we should not be here complaining of these shortcomings. It is the teacher who changes the society. And I think we have not done a good job when a age in preparing a teacher who can turn this continent around. Thank you. Thank you very That's much. That's my call. Academics in the other parts of the world are very highly respected and their opinion is respected. Um, in, this, in Africa, nobody cares. It's all perception. And that needs to change. Either we need to be more assertive and begin to impact the people, then we get the respect that all over the world our profession has. Professor said that leadership is a result of the education. We are struggling, wondering what kind of leaders are we producing? It is not about the education. It is about the moral values of our society that have just collapsed. The minute we lost what is it that hands people respect is when the problem came about. I think we still have one of the best education system, but of course a lot has changed with the crop of teachers that we're having. That teachers, when they were seen as a doyen of morality, they have now changed. We need to work on the entire social fiber, which as a, as a society we have to accept and agree. Let me specifically focus on leadership. Principally, an institution is as good as its leader, full stop. A country is as good as its leader. Any place you go, even a home, uh, is as good as uh, the leadership which uh, is manifested in that home. There are two pillars which uh, must be in place in order for the leadership to deliver, which is very critical, even as you discuss these uh, 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 SDGs. First of all, to be ethical. And a place the educational system in the place where it was expected to be and uh, call those of you who are leading these educational institutions to account for why you are given the responsibility of leading these institutions. Thanks, That's Prof. all I wanted to comment. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Dr. Kizito, Chambogo University, Kizito Po, Chambogo University. And my question is to uh, Professor Bitange, I was just wondering what could be some of the major challenges or drawbacks of using operations research tools like simulation in making analytical predictions or decisions pertaining to big data, because the problem is big data now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My name is Ochoa Kasairi from Chambogo University. My question goes to Professor Kenyawa Miriam. You said that uh, science should influence policy makers not policy. But we have seen situations where some pol politicians don't have a political will to implement some innovations. So how best, what best approach or approaches can be used to influence DC policymakers so that the innovations which science makes are implemented? Thank you. My name is Charles Zamone from Uganda, Chamaco University. The question is directed to the first presenter, food security where you said uh, food security has more to do with access to food as opposed to food production. I agree with you, but we know that there is a lot of research going on in the field of food production, pests, uh, research on pests, on seeds, post-harvest handling, and so on, and yet little is done, that side of uh, human, the human aspect of the human interaction. Now we have cases where in one country 
There is abundant food in one district, abundant and cheap, but in the other district, food is scarce and also very expensive. Don't you think there is need to do more research on the aspect of barriers to social interaction? I'm talking of linguistic barriers, racial barriers, you know, economic barriers, and so on. Don't you think there is more need for research in that aspect than food production? Thank you. Next. Okay, thank you. <coughs> My name is Dennis. I'm a former student of University of Eldoret. My question is going to the presenter from Tiveta. You presented on goal three and goal five about sexual and reproductive health. I've been working with schools and we realize that we have a challenge on teenage pregnancies. I, I don't know if Tiveta is doing something addressing the issue. You can see from mostly in primary schools and high schools during exams, you'll see media uh, reporting a lot of t teenagers and students and with issues of pregnancy. And also we realize that uh, when students go to the universities and colleges, they are exposed or they get freedom to access information. Uh, does that also contribute to the issue of teenage pregnancies in uh, Tibet institutions or Thank something you. like that? Thank you. Question number one. How or is there enough market to cover those who are going to graduate from TVETS number two? Where then is the role of postgraduate education? Because there's a bit of confusion right now with the politicians trying uh, to run the universities, for instance, encouraging mass disemployment, yeah, mergers and things like that, which is going to result into job losses for the postgraduate. Apart from that, we also have masses of postgraduates that are being employed, and I'm sure part of the group here, three quarters, are undertaking postgraduate education. What is the government going to do with this mass? Yeah, and what about the uh, the children uh, that we are bringing today uh, with the competency-based education? Uh, which is geared towards encouraging most of them to end up taking technical education. Uh, how are you uh, going to answer the child? Should you encourage them to move towards pursuing uh, a university degree later on? Yeah. So what, what becomes the bachelors, the masters, the PhDs in the future of Kenya? I think there is a need for balance and, and, and something to be clear towards our education system. Uh, you, and as I wind up, you, will please. the government be able to finance competency-based education during the tertiary level? What is the way forward? Thank you. And I said what we need to change more is our culture towards investments. Uh, we've been buying, say, University of Nairobi buys this, and then University of Eldoret wants to buy this. Uh, with cloud computing, um, I think it should be we can share across all universities. Um, one thing I did uh, for all universities was to provide broadband, super broadband. It used to be everybody would go and buy their own small broadband here and stuff. I think we must begin to think bigger and do that. But what I want to also say, tools are okay. Uh, we need to invest in tools. But when we talk about big data, there is so much data that can be analyzed, um, even some of the data that we have. I know young people in Nairobi who go around uh, estates, collect the garbage, open it up, and look at the packagings they have been able to come up with a very valuable information, which is market share. Like if you come to you, your house, this estate, and they, it's okay, simulations, good for prediction, we can take advantage of this space. I thank you all for inviting me. I would not agree more. I mean, I fully agree that uh, Research on social interactions is key for us to, be, to be able to supply the food where it is needed and to have it produced where it is best, the optimum conditions for production. About scientists influencing policy makers, 
the speaker talked about science influencing policy makers. It's, uh, in my presentation, I seen that it is the scientists to influence policy makers. Because science is there, it's a fact, science are facts. I touch on the call number three and number four. And basically the two is looking about the uh, issues to do with the information concerning um, health and more so health is um, getting to know the pro uh, reproductive health. And the thing is most of the problem that we have been having is towards either lack of information or what do we do when such a things happen. And it is expected that this this one is mainstream in the entire education system. Thank you. Um, what is the relevance of Professor Skada in improving the ethical issues in our various countries? We are less educated politicians use our professors to rig elections. And what is our role in reshaping the education by practically demonstrating our firm resolve to say no to all these wrong policies we are talking about. Thank you. Sir. I think uh, I'm looking at your policy that you are bringing up because as Tiveta comes out, you have given them training and skill. There is part that you're not mentioning. So what? Because a plumber must have a toolbox. And these are fresh graduates. Are you putting that component, com component into their graduation as a certificate? Um, by mentioning that we need to observe what we call the human resource um, uh, pyramid, where you have the managers uh, being fewer at the top and you have the workers at the bottom. Currently, it looks like we have an inverted uh, pyramid where you have more managers than the people they are managing and they have started managing themselves. The, the issue is we are not lacking jobs, we have jobs. But the sad thing is these jobs are elsewhere. I don't know what your experience is in Nigeria that uh, for us we have seen professors get into politics, highly respected people, scholars. But let me tell you, immediately they get jobs. I don't know what happened. So I don't know whether the political mindset totally takes away that academic autonomy, the ability to analyze issues objectively, and you just start talking like one of them. <laughs> Leaders must define destination and the mission of the institutions that they want to lead. My comment is that uh, we have all agreed that leadership is a rubricant that is going to make this a reality. So there is need to emphasize on ethical standards. And let me tell you, as a society, we must reach a point where we have to say enough is enough. And I think it is coming. When you have reached the rock bottom, when you want to raise up, you've got to take painful decisions. So the emphasis is on ethical standards. We must emphasize on ethical standards. We must insist on being honest respect, service to people, and people must know that when you are in a public position of leadership, it should be service to the public, not service to self. Again, we must now move to a very high level of accountability. How much are people being held accountable? How much are institutions being accountable for failing to undertake their mandate? That is another level we need to, to, to get into. I'm talking about consequence management. How many people get away with it with when they do things? And another thing, leadership must be committed to strengthen systems to enhance productivity and therefore enhance accountability. I think those are my parting shots and it has been my pleasure being with you.